Instead, Mac OS X on Intel uses a 4-4 switch. So, both the kernel and the user get 4 gig each. Consequently, only either can be mapped at a time. And a tiny switcher that is constantly mapped into the very top of the address space replaces the complete page table to switch between the kernel and the user address space. This design has been chosen to be able to map more devices, including large graphic cards, into the kernel address space, and it has an additional advantage. It provides user tasks with four instead of three gig. The downside of that is that two address space switches that are necessary for a syscall, including the TLB flushes, aren't that great for performance, again. Another property of the OS X kernel that isn't done in any other operating system is how support for 64-bit is implemented. While XNU supports 64-bit user applications in the respective 64-bit address space, the kernel itself is 32-bit code, and it resides in the lower 4 gig of the huge 64-bit address space. The picture is not really accurate, but it's simplified to get my point across. It is supported by a tiny amount of 64-bit code that sits at the top of the address space, which manages interrupts and switches between tasks and threads. The animation illustrates a switch from the kernel to a 32-bit user back to the kernel, then to a 64-bit user. This is probably not the cleanest design because the kernel cannot directly access the native address range and cannot make use of the extended set of wider registers that are available to 64-bit code. An advantage is that a single kernel Im image can be used on both 32-bit and 64-bit machines. Plus, the porting effort was minimized. And existing 32-bit drivers can be used unmodified. <clears throat> and besides PowerPC and i386, ARM is another architecture that XNU runs on since the iPhone's release in 2007. Although there is a big hype around the iPhone, there's not much special about its version of macOS. It's just another port to another architecture. But the iPhone uses a custom bootloader, and it does not support real texts. Um, it always uses a kernel cache because it doesn't support extra hardware. What's said about the ARM port is that the changes required for this architecture are not open source but large parts of Mac OS X are. Apple calls this open source parts of OS X Darwin. Darwin includes the kernel, many drivers, Unix text mode user land, and many libraries. Which, so Darwin is everything but the GUI and its support libraries. They release a new source drop with every minor release of Mac OS like 10.5.0 or 10.5.1. This is a part of the list of the packages that can be downloaded from Apple's open source website. You'll notice that some of the packages are Apple's own code, like XNU, and some are modified versions of common open source software, like zip, Perl, curl, and so on. <clears throat> Apple source is licensed under the Apple Public Source License, the APSL, which is a BSD-style license. And it's compatible with Sun's DDL, which allows the integration of Sun code, like DTrace and ZFS. But Darwin is not a typical open source project. There used to be the open Darwin community that worked on the Darwin source, but interest in this has faded, and today basically only Apple is working on the OS X source. The picture shows the lovely Darwin mascot, Hexley the Platypus. But although there is no hobbyist community working on the source, it doesn't mean being open source doesn't, doesn't serve a purpose, it does. The source is useful to CAX developers for debugging and governmental and research institutions and third-party vendors. They often work on modified versions of macOS. For example, the mandatory access control 
framework, which is integrated into Leopard, have been developed by a third party. Now that we've talked about some major distinguishing properties of macOS, let me tell you my eight favorite distinguishing features. Number eight is D-Trace from Sun. So it isn't a unique macOS feature. It was later ported to Apple, which is no problem, because like I just said, the CDDL is compatible with the APSL. Nevertheless, D-Trace is a very useful kernel feature. It is a framework for getting statistics data from the kernel with near zero speed impact. On a running system, D-Trace can just rewrite some kernel code to put code in there that does extra logging. And when the measurements are finished, the code can be removed again. Traditionally, the user either had to compile a special kernel with logging code in it, or always have this logging code enabled and suffer from the performance hit. Dtrace is very useful to get information about, for example, which syscalls does an application and how often, the number of mem memory allocations and freeze for a driver, those two are pretty obvious cases. A very obscure case is how often does great binary decide to run the 64-bit part of an executable, for example. Number seven, the kernel cache. Linux has a similar system with its initial RAM disks, the init RD, which are mounted before the actual root file system. And they contain a script that loads a set of drivers that also comes on this RAM disk. But it's just not as nice. Because the kernel first boots from a tiny installation in the RAM disk, including a shell, because you have to execute the scripts, and throws away the RAM disk and then boots the real root. This is a hack because neither the kernel nor the bootloader really support the concept of a kernel cache. On Mac, it is a supported concept, and the bootloader just loads a single file. Number six is the separation between Mark, BSD, and the I.O. kit. Unix was the big mess, as Tenenbaum called it, because every function inside the kernel could call every other function, and there was no strict layering. BSD and Linux copied this design. And although macOS does not have the advantages of a microkernel, the kernel is still strictly divided into three distinct parts. The I.O. kit, for example, forms its complete own world, and it only interacts with Mac through a narrow and strict interface. Number five is the POSIX conformance. Mac OS X was enhanced to pass the conf POSIX conformance test from the open group. So in contrast to Linux, it may carry the Unix trademark, but only since Leopard. Governmental customers want that. Fine by me. Number four, the Mark Message API. All Unix-like systems have the standard Unix means of IPC, like sockets, signals, and shared memory, but none of them is as powerful as Mark Messaging, because Mark Messaging handles security and queuing, and if necessary, even data conversion. But it is not a feature provided by some library, but it's handled directly by the kernel, unlike Corbo and Linux. Number three is the I.O. kit. The I.O. kit is a modern object-oriented driver infrastructure that supports inheritance, driver stacking. For example, CD-ROM sits on top of IDE, which sits on top of PCI, and it supports automatic matching and loading. Number two is the stable Kext ABI. On Linux, a driver module typically even doesn't load into the next revision of the kernel. While this has the advantage that Linux can change the driver API at any time, it makes it extremely hard for third parties to provide the user with drivers. On macOS, the driver API is typically compatible with several major releases, so that you can a lot like on Windows, just download a driver binary from the hardware vendor. And number one, which is my personal favorite, the desktop OS X runs on two completely different hardware architectures, or four 
if you also count the 64-bit versions. Nevertheless, it comes on one single install DVD, and an installed system can boot on any of the, sub of any of the supported architectures. And third-party applications that you download also run automatically on all systems. This is unlike Linux, VSD, and BSD, which acquire a different installer or installer CD, even for 32 and 64-bit versions of Intel, and they don't allow a 64-bit machine to boot, uh, sorry, a 64-bit installation to boot on a 32-bit machine. To conclude my talk, let's revisit the passwords again and clarify their relation to macOS. Mark. The Mac OS X kernel is not Mark. The Mac OS X kernel is XNU. XNU consists of Mark, BSD, and the IO kit. The OS X kernel is not a microkernel. The Mark code base can be used as a microkernel. XNU itself is a monolithic kernel. BSD and most drivers are in kernel mode. Free BSD kernel. The Mac OS X kernel is not based on the FreeBSD kernel. XNU contains some FreeBSD code. XNU is not written in C++. The I.O. kit is written in embedded C++. Mark and BSD are written in C. The Mac OS X kernel is not 64-bit. It supports 64-bit userland applications. The kernel code is 32-bit with tiny 64-bit parts for user support. The Mac OS X kernel and most of the Unix bits are open source, but there is no live repository. Some code is missing, but it can be compiled into a working system. Mac OS X is Unix, but only since Leopard, because it passed the POSIX conformance test and it now may use the Unix trademark, but it does not contain AT&T Unix code. But Mac OS X is awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much.